And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Yahshua of Nazareth, a man approved of Yahweh among you by miracles and wonders and signs which Yahweh did by him in the midst of you. As ye yourselves also know him, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord Yahweh always before my face, for he is on my right hand, and I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Acts 2, 18 through 28. May the reading of Yahweh's word bless you. Let's pray. Most wonderful Father, Yahweh, thank you for being our God and Father. Thank you for your Son, Yeshua. Christ, thank you for Rahab Kadesh, your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the privilege of prayer. Thank you for the understanding and the knowledge that you are deprogramming us from Satan's teaching that we may have been taught through the years in most of our churches in America and around the world. Thank you for guiding my tongue, my heart, with your wisdom to say and say only what you have put in my heart to say. I thank you that you have placed those to hear from you today, right now, right here. I thank you for letting them hear. I thank you for giving peace to the weary, peace to the brokenhearted, and peace to those that have not known your peace. Let them receive that peace today. Let them receive it, Father. Let them receive your Son today if they haven't. Let them receive the Holy Spirit today if they haven't. This is my prayer, and I pray it in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Welcome back, my friends, and may you be blessed. In our last chapter, we introduced the enemy. In order to realize what we are dealing with, we needed to introduce the enemy. In order to really understand religion, in this world you need to understand him because he created all the confusion satan's lies it's so evident he needs to be discussed because of where the rest of the story goes the next subject king solomon king solomon is in the middle of the pack because While he is a great testament to Yahweh and Israel in the beginning of his story, in the end of his story, Satan uses his mistakes a great deal to create doctrine for his own self's story. Freemasonry, faith-based investigation. If you do research on your own on this subject, 
you must be very careful because there is pure wickedness surrounding it. It can be a stumbling block for those not grounded in their faith. But if it is not covered and understood, it can be a cause for loss of faith if you come across the enemy side of it. So I've been praying for guidance from Raha Kadesh, the Holy Spirit, to communicate this to you and that it fills you with understanding and that it removes all confusion from you. 1 John 5.19 And we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. So let's begin. Today, the Truth Zone Part 7, the subject, King Solomon, the Temple, and the Freemasonry Connection. Before Part 6, we left off with Solomon becoming the next king of Israel after his father, King David. David secured a peaceful situation for Solomon. He defeated all of Israel's enemies so that when Solomon came to the throne, there was no one left to fight. This was also why David was not able to build the temple. He told Solomon, My son, it was in my mind to build a house unto Yahweh, but Yahweh came to me and said, You have shed blood abundantly and made great wars. You shall not build a house unto my name. You have shed much blood unto the earth in my sight. A son shall be born to you, who shall be a man of rest. I will give him rest from all his enemies round about, for his name shall be Solomon, and I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. That's First Chronicles 22, 8 through 10. David says to Solomon, So my son, I have prepared for the house of the Lord a hundred thousand talents of gold and a thousand talents of silver and of brass and iron without weight, for it is in an abundance. Timber also and stone have I prepared. Then David gave Solomon the plans for the temple that he had by the Spirit. The temple was to be a house for Yahweh, a holy place in which the Ark of the Covenant would be held and where burnt offerings would be done. Like he told Solomon, David made preparations for the temple before his death. He gathered the strangers that were in the land of Israel, but not actually of Israel. He had them gather stones to build the house, to prepare iron for the nails and brass and cedar trees in the abundance. David took care of much of the preparation, being wise and knowing that Solomon was young and inexperienced. And the house that must be built for Yahweh must be exceedingly magnificent, a faming of glory throughout all countries. So David did much of the groundwork. David was a good king. His reign over Israel was for a total of 40 years. From this, Solomon's kingdom was fully established. 1 Kings 3, 5-14 so Solomon was now king. Yahweh appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. Yahweh asked Solomon, What shall I give you? Solomon told Yahweh, You've shown great mercy to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Now, Yahweh, you have made your servant king 
instead of my father David. But I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? This pleased Yahweh. He told Solomon, because you have asked this thing and have not asked long life for yourself, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart so that there has not been anyone like you before, nor shall any like you arise after you. And I have also given you what you have not asked for, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings all your days. So if you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. That's 1 Kings 3, 11 through 14. So Solomon became the wisest king on earth, an example of his wisdom when two women appeared before him, each carrying a child, one living, the other dead. One woman accused the other woman of stealing her child after hers died, and the other denied doing so. Solomon, in his wisdom, ordered the living child to be cut in half with the sword and to be equally given to both women. The problem solved itself as the mother that accused the woman of taking her child said, No, just let her keep the living child. Do not slay it. And the accused woman said, That's fine, divide it. Solomon gave the child to the right mother who actually cared. That's 1 Kings 3, 16 through 27. All of Israel heard of the judgment that Solomon had judged, and they feared him because they saw Yahweh's wisdom was in him to do judgment. Solomon reigned over all Israel. In the fourth year of his reign as king, he began the work of building the temple of the house for Yahweh. 1 Kings 5, 6, and 7 describes this in detail. Solomon selected over 150,000 men to do work for the building of the temple. He sent word to Hiram, king of Tyre. He said, as you have dealt with David my father and sent him cedars to build a house for him to dwell in. So deal with me. Behold, I am building a temple for Yahweh to dedicate it to him. And the temple which I build will be great, for Yahweh is greater than all gods. Therefore send me at once a man skillful to work in gold and silver, in bronze and iron, in purple and crimson and blue. A man who has skill to engrave with skillful men who are with me in Judah and Jerusalem, who David my father provided. 1 Kings 5 Hiram answered back in writing, saying, Because Yahweh loves his people, he has made you king over them. Blessed be Yahweh who made heaven and earth, for he has given King David a wise son, endowed with prudence and understanding, who will build a temple for Yahweh and a royal house for himself. And now I have sent the skillful man endowed with understanding. Hiram, my master craftsman, the son of a woman of the daughters of Dan, and his father was a man of Tyre, skilled to work in gold and silver and bronze and iron, stone and wood, purple and blue, fine linen and crimson, and to make any engraving and to accomplish any plan which may be given to him. 
with your skillful men and with the skillful men of David your father. The man he sent was Hiram Abiff. He was a master mason and a central core of inspiration of Freemasonry. We will get into that later in the chapter. But the building of the temple was massive. You can read about how glorious it was in 2 Chronicles 3. At the end of the construction, Solomon assembled the leaders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes in Jerusalem, and they brought the Ark of the Covenant from the city of David to the temple. The Levites brought up the Ark and all the holy furnishings that all the congregation of Israel who were there did their sacrifices of sheep and oxen, a great multitude. The priest brought the Ark of the Covenant to its place in the inner sanctuary of the temple to the most holy place. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings in sacrifices, and the glory of Yahweh filled the temple. When all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and saw the glory of Yahweh in the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and worshipped and praised Yahweh, all saying, For he is good and his mercy endures forever. It took 20 years, but Solomon finished the house of Yahweh and successfully accomplished all that came into his heart. This was a remarkable accomplishment, and just reading this, you can feel the Holy Spirit leaping for joy in your heart. It's truly remarkable. You can read it for yourself in 2 Chronicles 5 through Eight. So Solomon is now older, and from this temple he built, he built an astonishment for the rest of the world. Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. All the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which Yahweh had put in his heart. Remember, Yahweh promised this. Solomon made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones. He had a massive amount of gold items. He was truly a splendor. So it was at this time of his splendor where he made mistakes. His biggest mistake was he loved women. Any man listening to this should learn from Solomon. He loved many foreign women, one of them including the daughter of the Pharaoh of Egypt. Earlier, he had made a treaty with the Pharaoh of Egypt and married the Pharaoh's daughter. He was not supposed to do this. He didn't need a treaty. Yahweh was to be Israel's protection. Yahweh would fight for them, but as Solomon's status of splendor grew, he took on more wives and concubines, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, the Sidonians, and the Hittites. He took wives from these nations of whom Yahweh had said to the children of Israel, You should not go into them, and neither shall they come into you, for surely they will turn your heart after their gods. But Solomon's flesh was weak. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. These wives turned Solomon's heart away from Yahweh. His heart was not loyal to Yahweh, as was the heart of his father David. He went after the gods and goddesses of these other nations like Ashtoreth of the Sidonians. Ashtoreth was the name of the moon goddess of the Sidonians, or Phoenicians. Don't forget about the pagan structure in case you didn't understand who Ashtoreth was when every time you heard, when Israel turned to her, 
and Baal before. So anyway, Solomon did evil in the sight of Yahweh. He built high places to worship Shemos, the abomination of the Moabites in Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. He did this all the time for all his wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. So Yahweh told Solomon, because you have done this and have not kept my covenant and statutes, which I commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Yahweh then raised up adversity against Solomon and this is the end of the story for Solomon. King Solomon reigned over Israel for 40 years and in his end the kingdom of Israel fell apart. The Bible does not really speak in depth about the last years of Solomon. You can read and learn from his wisdom in the book of Proverbs. The book of Ecclesiastes is said to be written by him. It is the book that speaks on his remorsefulness and desire to be right with Yahweh again. Now, what is the book of Ecclesiastes all about? It's in the Old Testament, written by Solomon in about 935 B.C., written near the end of Solomon's life. Wisdom. It was said to be written toward the end of his life. His story is not a happy ending. With Solomon's death expired the glory and power of ancient Israel. And though the scriptures do not go in depth on his level of disobedience and wickedness, it can be inferred or concluded that he did a great deal of wickedness based on how the enemy has tried to use him for his doctrine to try to build his kingdom. This is known specifically through Freemasonry and the occult. British Museum of the Occult. The occult world highly references King Solomon. I'm not claiming their beliefs are true or not, but I think it's important to understand the other side. Like I said in chapter 6, know your enemy. The occult world refers to Solomon as a skilled sorcerer. It's not that he only tolerated paganism, but also participated in it. According to one of the many legends about Solomon, Solomon used pagan magic to imprison 72 rebellious evil kings in a brass vessel, throwing them into a lake where they are supposed to stay until the end of time. Legend also says that in an attempt to find great treasure, the Babylonians rescued the vessel and broke it open, allowing the demons to escape. These demons became known as the 72 spirits or demons of Solomon. Among the Eastern nations, Solomon is again esteemed as a great magician who had great power over the spirit world. It was said he gained this power from Satan, who gave him a ring of power with a symbol on the ring. The symbol is known as the Seal of Solomon, also known as the Star of David. The Seal of Solomon is a hexagram and hides complex meanings and it is a symbol used highly in witchcraft. The two triangles pointing down represent water and earth. The two pointing up represents air and fire. The symbol was supposedly used on Solomon's ring and gave him the power to understand and communicate with animals and to conjure up spirits to do his bidding. Kabbalists and 
alchemists are very fond of this symbol. This symbol is also hidden on the back of the U.S. dollar bill. The way it is used today to represent the nation of Israel is very occult in nature. Their Star of David is not a symbol of Yahweh. In reference to Freemasonry, according to the Freemason Dictionary, the Temple of Solomon plays a very important part, a very important point. It is said in Freemasonry that Solomon, Hiram of Tyre, and Hiram Abib resided as Grand Masters over the lodges in which they established. It's said that symbolic degrees were instituted and their systems of initiation were invented. And from that period to this present, Freemasonry has passed them down. It's said that almost all symbolism of Freemasonry rest upon or is derived from the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem. Each Masonic Lodge is and must be assembled of the Jewish Temple. Every master in the chair represents Solomon and every Freemason is a person nation of the Jews who worked on this temple. I don't believe Jews built the temple. The Bible does not say they built it. Anyway, I'm trying to wrap my head around how they can be called Jews when the letter J did not and does not exist in the Hebrew or Greek alphabet. I do believe a group of satanic demons working through men or whatever they call themselves brought forth a demonic tradition that was perverted from good to their own liking. Listen. Look up the name of Jesus, Joshua, John, Job, etc. There were no J's. Know your enemy. Know your enemy. That's why I did part six of this series, Know Your Enemy, before introducing this subject. It's important to know that Satan wants to be like Yahweh, so he must use the things of Yahweh but pervert them. This is why there will be an antichrist. Isaiah 14, 13 and 14. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high Yahweh. I pray it starts connecting with you, my dear brothers and sisters. I pray it starts connecting with you that Satan's primary goal is to pervert the things of Yahweh. He's not just making up his own doctrine, but it must be a perversion of Yahweh's doctrine. Satan's lies, see? That is why the building of the third temple is so important to this new occult age. This is really the goal of Freemasonry and the events transpiring today are being orchestrated by these men within the structure of power. Freemasonry is not just an organization. It is a satanic religion. But I will get into that later in more detail. The point of this knowledge, number one, from Solomon's mistake, the glory of ancient Israel went downhill. Number two, Satan used Solomon's disobedience in creating and establishing his doctrine for future worship of him by his own name. Number three, Freemasonry and the occult all used Solomon as a symbol of their rebellion maybe because of how great and important Solomon was. And my prayer is that in this part of the series, it answers some questions. This history is very important to understand. 
So you must learn history. This is the last time you will hear of the United Twelve Tribes of Israel. In the next part of the series, you will learn about the division of Israel and Judah. Have you heard of the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel? This understanding will be coming up. I hope this sparks a desire for you to dig into Yahweh's word and rebuke Satan at every turn. The goal of this series is for us not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. I hope that turns to be true for you. Here's a list of books some information came from. The Antichrist, Freemasons, and the Third Temple. That's Satan's scheme to be worshipped on the mountain of God by Douglas Hemp. The Magic of Solomon. Limageddon Secrets Revealed How to Revoke Angels into the Crystal The Magical Treaties of Solomon The Seal of Solomon The Gotia The Lesser Key of Solomon the King by Samuel Lydell, McGregor Mathers, and Alistair Crowley The Clavis or Key to Magic of Solomon from the original Talismanic Grimoire by Ebenezer Sibley. If this blessed you, please share it with others. Have Bible studies around the topics and keep the discussion of Yahweh's word going. Thank you for your time, your listening, and your reading. I love you all. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this message. Thank you for the understanding. Thank you for the listeners and readers understanding. Give them understanding of what you're saying. In Yeshua's name, in Yeshua's name, we pray. Amen.